Well, welcome Paul and Carrie and Nancy and Stephanie and Terry who joined us uh, during the meditation. So I'm going to begin us today with actually a bit of an announcement. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's not right. Here we go. So can anyone guess what I am doing in this picture? On a radio podcast. Uh, a good guess, but that is not what I'm doing. It is a microphone in front of me. You're hosting a radio show? I'm not hosting a radio show. You're modeling headphones. That is it. I am <laughs> modeling headphones. I have a new career as a headphone model. Now, what I am doing is I am recording an audiobook of uh, Spiritual Practice of Good Actions. So the publisher um, bought the print rights, but they did not buy the audio rights. And it's been something that I have wanted to do since the book came out. And it always got pushed off. And I bought the equipment, but I didn't really think that I could do a good job of recording it myself. And so finally I learned there was a, a studio with very reasonable rates where I could go and rent uh, rent time and I have a producer and an engineer and somebody who can do the the post-production so I'm uh, I'm pretty excited about that so uh, I did kind of do my voice in on Monday uh, overdoing it so I've had to take it a little bit easier but it is um a good lead-in for patients because I had to be patient for a really long time to to get to this and so I am curious, what is something that's on your list that you finally got to? And it may not have been recently this, that this happened, but you know, something which for a long time you wanted to do, and then you, and you finally got to it. I, I, this is Eliana. Yeah. I don't know if this counts because it's not something I'm doing, but something I get to do, which is canter at high holidays on this coming season. Oh. So I'm pretty excited. So it is a dream come true. Dream come true. Wonderful. Mazel tov. That is really exciting. Who else? Anyone else? Um, something that you've, yes, Nancy. I don't know. I have to laugh at this, I guess. Um, so I've lived in my house now 22 years. Okay, 22. And I finally got rid, I, I'm getting rid this Sunday of 30 chairs, three tables, a chest of drawers, a screen door. I ended up getting rid of the basketball hoop today. Um, a uh, disadvantaged school came by and picked it up. I gave it to them. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, I've got a new house. That's what it feels like. <laughs> it Wonderful. just feels so good to get rid of the bulky, bulky items that just take, you know, take place in your place. It just feels like the clutter is gone now. So it's a big thing on a list. <laughs> it is. That is wonderful. It reminds me we've lived in this house. Uh, 19 years and I've wanted to paint the bathroom uh, the entire time and we have not done it and it's just yeah. like you know uh, it's just a little little too much patience for that yes Marianne um, I've been looking for volunteer work that I enjoy and I found some um, um, driving around refugees from Afghanistan and the Ukraine and other places. And I really enjoy that getting to meet different people because they don't have cars. Very nice. Beautiful, really, really uh, helpful, I'm sure. Anyone else have something that was on your list for a long time? Yes, Carrie. I'm finally teaching again after Five years of not teaching, and it feels wonderful. Congratulations. 
Thank you. That is fantastic. A lot of, a lot of patience to get to these things. Um, anyone else care to share anything? Okie doke. Not a problem. Um, let's start to dig in a little bit more. So the assumption for this week that I think is relevant to patients uh, is that there is a divine spark in everyone, which is occluded by our baggage. So again, the divine spark that comes from the story of Genesis, that we were created in the divine image. And if you're not sure of the divinity, um, you can think of this as kind of the common, common spark of humanity that, that we all share. Um, and then we have our baggage, our hurts, and those things that happen in life, which kind of, which kind of get in the way. So how might this relate to patients? Can you put that up again? Sure. Let me um, put it in the, uh, in the chat. For questions or comments on this, this Musa assumption, of course, we can talk about that too. Hey, Sarah, nice to, nice to see you. Yes, Paul. So I think that uh, how this relates to patients for me is that um, <clears throat> in my dealings with people either in, you know, personally or at work, that there are times when uh, I can be, uh, I can feel irritated at somebody else because I think they are being, that they're wrong in some way or they're treating me badly in some way. And for me, the patience is allowing myself to uh, sit with those feelings because, you know, the first flush is not necessarily a bad thing. It just lets me know there's something that happened, but that doesn't mean that what I think happened is what happened. It just means there's something. And so allowing, being patient with my own process, I think is, is the main thing. Not so much patience with other people, although I think that sometimes I'm being patient with somebody else, but really it's, I'm patient with myself mm -hmm. so that I come up with something that, that uh, is more realistic or rings more truly. Thank you, Paul. That sounds like a, uh, like a really wonderful practice. Can you say, it sounds like you were inspired to share that with us, but this idea of the divine spark and the baggage, is there kind of a connection between the okay. two in your mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, um, you know, there's somebody that I joke <clears throat> with others about, you know, at work. Uh, I joke with, with family members, not with other people at work about it because it's not appropriate. But I, I say that he's my nemesis. But it's really because in my brain, you know, he represents something. What's your nemesis? Somebody. Oh, oh, a real person? Yeah, a real person. A real oh. person is my nemesis, yes. Um, and um, so the divine spark is really realizing that whatever I think I perceive this person is saying or what their intention is, um, is the occlusion is really my baggage. It's really the overlay that I put over this person. This person is uh, somehow saying things that remind me of things my father said when I was a kid that really hurt me. and rather than me taking a step back immediately and thinking, is that really what's happening? And it's really, I feel the hurt first and then I have to, and so it's my baggage is in the way of me understanding this person's actually being very generous. Gotcha. Thank you, Paul, that, that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for, for sharing that with us. Does anyone else sort of, have thoughts about this 
this idea of the divine spark and baggage and how it might impact um, how it might impact patients. Well, let's go a bit deeper. So uh, I'm not going to, well, I haven't planned on opening this up today because we talked about it a bit last week, but not everyone was here. So if anyone has a comment, that's okay. We had two things on the slide. One is the mantra, which we'll review again later, which is this too shall pass. And I have the strength to get by until it does. I think last week someone had a really nice um, revision of this. I have the strength too. Does anybody remember if you were the person who suggested it or remember what they said? Um, I have the strength to cope or I have the strength to manage. Um, so that was a nice variation. And then in the spectrum of patients, if we have two little patients, we can get angry and frustrated. And too much, we can be kind of inactive and, and fatalistic. And I think in terms of my audiobook, I actually had a pretty balanced patient approach. Sometimes I would get sort of impatient and frustrated that it wasn't, you know, kind of coming along and I quote, should have had the time to get it done. But um, I think overall, I just knew it was something that I would get to eventually. But for today, um, there's a couple of interesting quotes here. So may I have a volunteer to read the first bullet, please? I can, I can read it. Great, uh, the, the essence of patience is to live in the present. We are impatient because we want to be in the future faster than reality will take us there. Since we will generally be in the exact same place, whether we will experience patience or impatience, it makes sense to choose to be patient. Thank you. Is that Marianne? I couldn't see who that was. So, okay, so I've put Rabbi Pliskin's uh, wisdom in the chat. So what is he what is he teaching us? What is it that he is trying to say? Yes, Bonnie. Well, I think it's we want it now. Hmm. Um, and I have to I had this discussion almost today with another friend about the era that I grew up in, we didn't have, I mean, I didn't have a computer. I had a regular typewriter. My big exciting thing was an electric typewriter when I went to college. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I was more patient when I was younger because things had to take time. I had to get to that World Book Encyclopedia and I had to figure out what I was going to research and I had to read the stuff and it wasn't instant. Um, and I, I don't know when he wrote this, but I, I think that certainly the kids I teach, the young adults I teach, want it now. And that's not what happens with me, where my patience gets lost. It's not that I want something very, I want something to happen right now, and I, and I can't wait until it happens. Maybe that's what I think he's saying. My issue is that I get impatient when I've already started being upset over something. And then I lose the patience. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin. Uh, yeah, I think Bonnie brought up a good point about technology. It's uh, yeah, when I used to have to rely on a uh, fax machine for communication or even send something by mail. <laughs> Um, and get a response by the U.S. Postal Service. Um, uh, now with technology, yeah, it's, uh, it seems like technology response can be faster than our emotional response. 
And mm -hmm. I think maybe that's the gap that that's creating um, the test of patience. <laughs> so, yeah. Great, um, great comparison with the technology versus um, versus Our emotional pace. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What about this last sentence where he says, since we'll be in the same place, whether we experience patients or inpatients, it makes sense to choose to be patient. Hey, Joanne, nice to see you. So what do people think of that? Is it just that simple? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just choose to be patient. <laughs> oh, that's it. I should, I should choose to be patient, huh? <laughs> Martin, did you raise your hand again, or is uh, that yes? Yeah, it's uh, well. The reality is um, the uh, the conclusion that you want or your goal, it, it will come in its own time. But mm -hmm. uh, it's be realistic. <laughs> Don't be unrealistic about expecting when you're going to achieve what you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Harry. Yeah. Um... I, I didn't. I have this um, app that does quotes, and I and I put uh, patience and to see what came up. I came up with an interesting quote and that sort of relates to this mm -hmm. quote. It says, um, "If you think of patience as a virtue, patience is the art of concealing your impatience." Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It is, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm just... not, yeah. I'm not sure that's a Musar definition. But it's a, it's an but isn't that what we struggle? It's an art <laughs> mm -hmm. to conceal your impatience. But if you think of it as a virtue, that's something. It gives you the. It gives you a reason to try. Yes. Well, I think trying to be patient is is important for sure. Eliana, did I see your hand? Yeah, I don't know how to do that yellow hand. I can't figure it out. Oh, um, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, where he says we're in the same place, I don't, uh, I don't know what he means by that. I don't agree with that, emotionally mm -hmm. speaking, because if you know, I was just out trying to find a replacement for my outdoor faucet, and you know, you wander those big box stores, and there's nobody there. And if I was impatient I would be in a horrible emotional state and so I wasn't and in the end she said well we don't have anybody working in plumbing and I said well, okay I'll just go to Ace Hardware and that guy helped me there but mm -hmm. in terms of being in the same place I um I think I know what he means but but the uh the feeling of impatience is so horrible mm -hmm. and it takes you out of being in the present moment. The minute you're impatient, that means you you took your ego and threw it out in front of everybody. You know, it's like, why is it the world serving me? So yeah, anyway, that's what I thought of. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because yeah, maybe, okay, if I'm in traffic, I would literally be in the same place. But in terms of like, you know, who you are as a person and what you're experiencing and how you're traveling through life, it's not the same place at all if you're sort of raging mad and impatient versus just like, okay, yeah, you can't help me, that's fine. I'll, I'll take my business elsewhere. Uh, we have Wendy and then Karen. I was thinking of little kids and they're told uh, they can't have an ice cream cone until 10 o'clock but it's 9.30 and they come up with all kinds of creative ways to be impatient and to show their impatience, thinking that it's gonna change that clock. But I think that's maybe what Rabbi's saying is, your impatience is not going to make the clock tick any faster. Mm -hmm. What's gonna happen is gonna happen and it's time. So 10 o'clock rolls around, the kids get the ice cream and they're really happy. But in the interim, the impatience hasn't, worked and maybe they missed out on something because they weren't patient they maybe missed out on doing something else or maybe we're just happy or one more patient but just the impatience not going to help yeah. well <laughs> said well said how are you feeling i'm a lot better thanks yeah 
good. Karen, I saw your hand go up and down. Did you have something you wanted to add or are you, you good? Yeah, actually, um, I just have moments because I'm in the airport parking lot waiting for my husband and my son. Oh, um, okay. So yeah, they're playing lands, they're just waiting. Um, my, I have a mantra and I don't remember where I got it from and it relates here. It is, it's just patience is a choice. I don't remember if somebody had said that or it came from conversation in, in maybe another Musar class, but I kind of live by that every day. Um, and I, I also live by impatience doesn't always get a quicker result. As a matter of fact, I think to myself, being impatient could delay the result that I want. So those are two um, lines of thought that I'm very consciously aware of, which is that patience is a choice and impatience does not always get me what I want faster. As a matter of fact, it can make the situation worse. Yeah, uh, both are absolutely true. And I asked the question before, is it, you know, that, you know, is patience a choice? And, and it is. And, you know, one of the other assumptions is we have free will and we can't always ex ex access it. And if we start getting all worked up, it gets harder and harder to choose to be patient. And the more that we're kind of in the habit of choosing to be patient, in uh, low stress, low stakes situations, it can help us build up those patience muscles and form that habit of choosing patience. Well, what I love about patience is a choice is that sometimes you need to have a little less patience. And so I'm very aware of what the choice is when it comes to patience. It doesn't mean be very patient all the time and be stepped on or miss an opportunity um, or don't get help. The fact that patience is a choice is something that I have to look at when I'm feeling a little anxious and say, you know, can I be a little more impatient? Is that what's right or not? So that's why I think why using the word choice is so important for patients. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great point. And as we've, we've covered, it is not, um, it's not always the right call. So yeah, um, we could, you know, the more that we're mindfully in the moment and making active choices, the better, better choices we can make. Is that Paul or Carrie? Paul. So I was <clears throat> reflecting on what Eliana had, had said about, you know, being in a big box store and running out of patience there because not getting anybody to help. And that's, you know, one way, you know, that's a signal that our body gives us, I suppose, that uh, things aren't going right. We need to pay attention to it. Doesn't mean that we uh, need to stay impatient, but it means we need to think about what's happening. And in her case, the way to resolve that was to go to a, di a different place, different uh, store to get the thing that she needed. And it wasn't, you know, it didn't mean like if you're angry and frustrated, you need to go back to the, the other polar opposite, um, uh, being you know sort of passive and waiting for things to come your way because you're going to be patient and you know the Lord will provide or something like that. You know it's not that kind of patience. It's really I think patience with the process that sometimes uh, the way we think something is going to be resolved isn't the way we that it's going to be. We have to take a different route in order for that to, to happen. So it's it's an interesting dance. I think that's, you know, what, uh, what was just being talked about as well. Thank what, you, Paul. What Karen said, being a choice. Yeah, absolutely. I think your comment is a great segue to the next reading for us. Let's see, close this. We're gonna go back to full screen. We can open this again. May I have a volunteer to read um, to read this this uh, text, please? Yes, Bonnie. Musar teaches patience with ourselves and others. The patience it takes to forgive our own anxieties and doubts and the consequences that may bring to our lives the patience it takes to postpone and adjust our visions, 
the patience it takes to perceive ourselves and others clearly, the patience it takes to assess, access, and accept our reality, including our fears, and the time it takes to become more faithful and trusting. Mm. Rabbi Piltz, the Musar Torah commentary. Thank you. Mm. So what is it? I hear some some reactions, and we're going to this will be a starting point for um, some of our discussion and partners. But before we get there, I'd love to get some reactions. What is Rabbi Piltz? What is what is the point she's making here? Does anyone sense a, a common theme? There it is in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. A lot there, isn't there? Yeah, Bonnie. So for me, the first sentence really talks about the issues that I deal with, which is not necessarily the anxieties, um, but it is the anxieties. It's that I want, I, I, I'm usually missing some information or not able to do something correctly. And I end up, getting starting already out, starting out already unhappy mm -hmm. annoyed and then usually is a phone call to a representative mm -hmm. um and i have to work really really hard and not be rude really hard i don't want somebody to repeat what i just said i mean i know <laughs> just said don't repeat it back to me uh, it, it's something I struggle with. And, um, and I have a friend who pointed it out to me. He said, you're so good when something goes well and you make sure you tell the supervisor. But I noticed your tone is not so nice <laughs> when you're talking to somebody that you have a problem with. And she was right on target. And so <laughs> this, it is the anxieties. It's that I can't do it. I need your help. And you're not helping me <laughs> the way I need it. And those are the real challenges in life. Like when everything's going great, you know, <laughs> we don't need Musar, you know, we should still practice it to build our muscles, but it's when we get to our personal <laughs> challenge, that's where, that's where we, we really need it. Yeah, Joanne. Yeah, I guess where the rubber hits the road. I, I had an experience yesterday um, because of my medical situation, uh, I called this well renowned doctor in our congregation who made a referral to me. So, till I got through to the right number, and finally I did because I felt like it's important to be persistent with this because I'd like a second opinion. And finally, I got someone, and then they were trying to help me put something on my phone, like a certain app or. I don't know, first we tried this way and that didn't really work. And then she said, oh, download the app. And that worked. And, but at the same time, it was like, I'm hungry. I haven't had lunch yet. And it's like, it was going on for a long, it really was a long kind of call. Mm. But in the end, it paid off because I was able to like put all my medical records from one hospital onto this other thing. And, and then the other people can look at it. And, and now it's, you know, I could even do it for a third hospital, maybe. I, I might go for a third opinion. But, you know, it's just, you know, and I was complaining. The woman was very nice, I have to say, and she was patient. And I said, you know, I'm not the greatest technology person. <laughs> and... But she was, and she figured out where we went wrong, and then we fixed it, and then it was good, and I was so happy, and now I probably need to go on there and sign some papers. But anyway, but it was, it got done, and then I was able to go on to something else. So sometimes it's really trying your patience to get to the point where you want to be, but you know, there's like no point in giving up. Then you're nowhere. You're back at square one. That's all. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you for sharing. Sure. Um, 
Okay, so we'll hear from Karen and then we'll go to our breakout. I'll sh share the breakout room question. So my quick other thought is that when I'm feeling impatient, I dig deeper into my kindness, kindness to others and kindness to myself. Um, because I remember that other people could be having a worse day than me. And I know it's a saying, and I, at this point in my life, and it sometimes, you know, when I'm feeling impatient about something, I can see that I have blessings that somebody else might not have at that time. And it, it may be different. There may be some time when I, when everything just seems like a crisis to me and I just, I'm feeling impatient and I can't rein it back in. Mm. But one of the other, two of the other techniques I take is to dig deeper with kindness when I feel myself becoming impatient. And the other is to say, I don't know what else is going on in the other person's life. And maybe the other person isn't as educated. Like maybe I need to, and maybe there's some other stressor I don't know. So if I can't find one way, you can't go over. Maybe you can go under, you can go through, you can go around. Um, so I try those things. So it doesn't mean I, I don't feel impatient. It's just, those are two other techniques that I use to help myself. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Those are great, great techniques. And it's... Um... So it's not like we can just sort of snap our fingers. Sometimes we need to have a strategy. And I think what I'm hearing is you've kind of developed these and they're not um, sort of something in the moment when you're getting, when you are activated that you need to figure out, you have sort of your fallbacks that you can go to. Exactly. Right. So um, I've put our question in the chat, um, which is, which of these would you like to cultivate in yourself? And these are all from Rabbi Piltz's uh, list. Forgive our own anxieties and doubts, postpone and adjust our visions, perceive ourselves and others clearly, mm. access and accept our reality. Mm. So these are the questions. Um, the breakout rooms are now open. Mm. So please click accept and we'll have a few minutes to discuss. Welcome back everyone. Well, I would love to kind of hear how your discussions went and which of those things um, that you would like to cultivate in yourself. And again, I love that mm -hmm. word cultivating, you know, it's not like we can. Right. Um, of course, now I forgot what the one was. It was like... They're in the chats from before, if anyone needs Let's see if I can find the chat here. Reminder. Uh, yeah, perceive ourselves and others clearly. I guess the next one goes along with the, is the next step, like access and accept our reality. But the, perceiving ourselves and others clearly is my choice and one other person in the group. And we had like three mottos that, were, that came up. Patience is a choice, is one. Mm -hmm. Be curious, not judgmental. And the third one was seek first to understand before to be, you know, seeking to be understood. So that also is about patience. Yeah, absolutely. And like some of those, like not being judgmental, that might be practicing kavod or honor as a mm -hmm. way to help kind of build our patience. So patience, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. humility, really obviously intersects with so many other Everything, subjects. everything sort of intersects, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. I um when I went to record uh and my recording appointment was at 9 30 up in San Francisco. So usually it's like a 45 minute drive, but I was worried about traffic because it was the morning. So I planned things out and saw how long it would take and I jumped in the car and my daughter had not refilled it and it was almost out of gas. So oh, I, I was yeah. able to I was able to get up to the city, but I had to kind of stop on the way home at sort of the really expensive gas station. So I just sent her a text message. Hey, can you uh, refill the car today? I partially filled it and we'll pay for it, but don't leave me a car with an early morning 
meeting Nein. a bassinet. So, Nein. yes. All right. How about other people? What um, what did you, you know? Anything stand out from your discussions, or what is it that you're? Excuse you me. Like someone's at my door. Oh, go right ahead. Hello. Hello. Okay, I'm muted, Joanne, so we don't hear her whole discussion. Um, okay, other other folks. Yeah, Carrie. I'm I'm looking at the list, and I think I probably have a little bit. I'm kind of uh, focusing on a little bit of all of them. I was telling uh, our group that I had a friend visiting for a few days and she and I have been friends since we're six months old and um, we're both turning 70 and we're both having a hard time with that issue. So we were practicing while we were together, patience with ourselves and the new reality. You know, we're, we're, we're assessing what's happening with us physically and mentally and um, trying to um, embrace that and be patient with it and make the, make it a really positive thing, which I think we're doing. So it, it's been interesting. It's a, uh, I'm practicing a lot of patience these days. Yeah. With, yeah, well, it sounds like a very meaningful, meaningful one is to sort of accept the new reality. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Who else? Which of these stand out to you? Yes, uh, Shelley. Um, so uh, mine, I think, was the kind of the last one, perceiving others and uh, and then perceiving your own reality and all that kind of stuff. and. And I think when, you know, what I've been coming up against with myself is um, when we have those reactions, you know, and, and to instead of going into the reaction and, you know, because of some person's whatever words or comments, which it's own, our own perception anyway, but it's, it's kind of to stop myself from having that reaction to kind of find, first of all, go, well, what's this about me that I'm trying to understand? But then almost taking a breath too, and almost taking a step away from the situation to, to not keep myself in anger or frustration or whatever, go through whatever I need to understand about myself, but then also look at the other person as well and think, okay, what's going through them right now with their life? You know, what are they desiring in life? What are they disappointed in life about? Right, because their actions, their words that are coming at you all the time have a certain tone. So obviously something is going on in them, but they're not verbalizing it, right? So I mean, what I'm talking about is something with my son that just kind of occurred. And so I I I took myself out of it for a second and you know calmed myself down. I didn't react to his reaction. And, and I thought, you know what, I need to kind of understand my reaction first, and then we're going to start figuring his reaction out. And, you know, we actually had a, a more loving conversation than me being a parent saying, don't do this, don't do that, blah, blah, blah. And him just probably shutting right off, right? You know, he actually shared something and I shared something and we had a laugh and a hug. And I was like, okay, high five. Let's, let's hope the next time that we come up against this, you're not going to be at 90% again. And, you know, you're going to, you're going to recognize that I don't do that to you. So I, I get it. You're a teenager, you're figuring out your hormones, but, you know, can we bring it down to at least 85 so that I can have a bit of a breather? <laughs> and we laughed and, you know, whatever. But so that's what I'm saying. You know, that's, that's the patience because I, I looked at myself first and then looked at him without, you know, making an assumption, I just thought I need to find out what's going on in his life, right? Like, you know, I get it's the hormones, it's all that stuff, but anyway, so that's me. It's such a, thank you, Shelley. It's such a great list because these are all very powerful practices. And when I hear you saying, 
you know, perceiving ourselves and others, you know, and the, what I'm hearing from your story and what you're demonstrating is patience is a part of that because that's not a fast process, especially when something happens and everybody starts getting, you know, whatever. So, you know, like being patient enough to kind of take the time you know, in my work where I'm trying to facilitate conversations across the political spectrum, someone said, well, can you like come and just do like a 10 minute version of this for the board at the synagogue? And I'm like, no, I cannot do a 10 minute version of this. This is a slow process. This takes time to, you know, really give people a chance to be heard. And until someone's heard, they're not going to be open to listen necessarily. So we have to give things the amount of time and space they need. Paul, I see your hand. Yeah. Um, so I realized when actually when Carrie was talking that there was a, uh, a lesson in patience for me uh, in her process with her friend. Now they've known each other, like she said, since they're six months old. And um, I have to admit, and I haven't said this before, so this is on live TV here. So you're seeing it, <laughs> this is real stuff. That um, I was getting jealous that, you know, the two of them were gonna be like experiencing being 70 together. I'm not 70 yet, I won't be 70 for another two years. So I can't really help out. But that they were going to like, going over to, uh, uh, Europe, they're planning on that to do art together, which is wonderful. And I was feeling like left out and jealous at, at first. And so I can't, I just sat with it. I knew it was like, I didn't want to rain on anybody's parade. I, I knew that was inappropriate. I knew that. So I thought, all right, so let me just, what is going on? And ultimately, I had to realize that I'm not the right person to really help carry out in everything she does. I mean, I've been her partner for, you know, 22 years and we're celebrating our 20th anniversary of being married this year. And so that's a long time, but she's got, you know, Barb has decades on me. And <laughs> it is together that uh, I just, that there's, it's not a matter of competing. It's just that there's so much shared life there. And for me to be patient and say, you know what, I'm here for a lot of reasons, but maybe getting past 70, being a woman, clearly not my, my role. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that, Paul. That's, um, that looks like, uh, sorry to kind of put everybody's stories in a box, but that sort of feels like forgiving our own anxieties and doubts, you know, sometimes, you know, which again, that's a, gotta give ourselves, you said you sat with it. You know, so it's like, okay, you know, why am I feeling this way? And oh man, am I a crappy husband? Am I, you know, whatever? And it's it's like, so uh, congratulations on allowing that that to unfold. Well, friends, before we go, I'm gonna just pop up once again this list of we're not quite there yet this list of um, the mantra and some possible actions to kind of inspire, inspire work. These are all from, you know, as it says at the bottom, these are all, all from the book, but if you don't have it or if you don't have time to look at it, maybe just take a moment to look these over and see if it inspires you for what something that you might want to practice, or maybe it's going to be more related to the things that we just talked about cultivating. But moving from here today and bringing the kind of practice out of the Zoom and more to your life is where the real opportunity for personal, personal transformation can take place. So with that, let us all once again close our eyes. And take in a deep breath through the nose and hold. And exhale through the mouth and hold. Inhale through the nose. And a slow, leisurely exhale.
And as we go through our week, may we all have the strength and feel comforted to be patient, to allow things to unfold. To allow our choices to become clear, whether to act or continue to wait. To forgive ourselves, to understand others, to accept the world as it is. While at the same time, not losing sight of the way the world could be. Well, friends, thank you all so much for being here today. Oops, that's not what I'm trying to do. I was just trying to stop.